Welcome to today's webinar, Driving and Multiple Sclerosis. Your presenter today is Lindell Cook, and I'm your facilitator, Nicola Graham. So I'd like to just acknowledge and pay respects to the traditional custodians past and present on whose lands we meet today. And I'd like to acknowledge the deep feelings of attachment and the relationship of Aboriginal people to country and our respect for the cultural authority of the elders in each community. So I'd like to introduce our presenter to you today. So Lindell Cook is based in Sydney. She's a driver trained occupational therapist. She has worked in the area of driver assessment and rehab for over 20 years. Lindell's experience spans all diagnostic groups, including neurological conditions, amputees, traumatic brain injury, and spinal cord injury. She's got extensive experience scripting a range of vehicle modifications from basic driving controls to wheelchair accessible vehicles and high level drive from wheelchair modifications. So a lot of experience. And as I said before, please do type in any questions that you that you have. Just want to note here around informed choice. And then I'm just going to change screen and invite Lindell to pop her webcam on, please, Lindell. Mm -hmm. And that box will come up for you to take control and to share your screen. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Lindell. That's wonderful. We can see you and we can see your slides. So I'll hand over to you now. Okay, great. Um, hi everyone, thank you for joining me today as we um, talk about driving and MS. Um, please do, if you've got questions, um, would love to do these along the way so we stay on track. Um, what I wanted to do today was really look at um, how, a little, touch briefly on how MS may affect your ability to drive, um, what your legal obligations are as a licensed driver um, with a medical condition, um, and the processes that are available that can help you to continue to drive. Um, if you've got a condition like MS, it doesn't mean you can't drive, um, and the role of an OT is to try and help you to continue to drive um, as much as we possibly can. Um, and we'll also briefly touch on some options that are available if you can't drive as well. Okay, so we all know that driving is a complex task. Um, a lot of the times when we drive, things come automatically, but there is actually a lot of stuff that goes on inside of our head um, to make it become quite automatic. Um, so there's a lot of high level skills that you need to have um, and a lot of different abilities and reaction times um, in response to different things that are going on in the environment around you. Driving is actually a privilege. It's not a right we have as a member of the community. So um, not everybody can drive. Um, not everybody should drive. Um, so it is actually a, a privilege that we have to be able to access the community. Um, so there's lots of complex interactions between our physical abilities, um, our movement, our strength, our coordination, um, our perceptual abilities, how we um, take in the information in the environment, the, the visual information, um, the spatial information, and then our cognitive skills. So being able to remember road rules, um, being able to remember procedures, being able to remember where we're driving, how to use different controls, how to make decisions. So it's quite a complex thing that does seem automatic to us sometimes when we get in the car. Okay, so when you've got a condition like MS, um, the best thing to do is to have a comprehensive assessment, particularly if there are cognitive issues um, and some motor deficits going on. So um, when, when you have a condition um, that can affect your ability to physically control the vehicle or affect your ability to make decisions, having a thorough assessment is the gold standard to determine if everything's still okay for you to continue to drive. So as you would know, um, some of the impairments from MS can include this list that I've got. Um, obviously, um, 
symptoms vary from person to person. Symptoms can vary from time to time as well, depending on the, the nature of your MS. Um, but the, the, these are generally the list of things that will affect um, someone's ability to drive with MS. So if there's loss of muscle strength and sensation, that's going to affect your reaction time and your ability to um, use the physical controls of the vehicle. Um, physical fatigue, might allow you, you, you're able to use the controls, but for how long you can drive, um, and cognitive fatigue, so your ability to um, maintain that concentration and attention. MS can affect your reaction time, can affect your memory, so your ability to, um, to recall, um, particularly where you're going sometimes, um, or the ability to remember how to um, proceed in different situations. Attention and concentration can be affected, the ability to plan and judge what's going on around you and the speed of that planning and judgment. So knowing what you need to do, but, but processing that information so you come to a decision in a timely manner. Visuospatial perce visual perception can be affected, um, which can impact upon how you position your vehicle on the road, how you perceive the other vehicles on the road and how you interact with them. Um, and then there's the effects of the, of your, the side effects of your medication as well, which can impact upon your ability to drive. So things like um, drowsiness or um, some cognitive changes from medication. So generally these types of symptoms need a doctor um, to discuss driving with you um, so that we can work out what is the best course of action. Do you need a full assessment um, or does a doctor feel confident in making a decision on your ability to drive? So I just really wanted to find out from the people that, that are here online, have you ever discussed your driving with your doctor? Um, is it something that um, you're worried about discussing because you're worried about the consequences um, or it is something that you've addressed. Um, so if we can have a have a look at it, at how many people have discussed it with their doctors. Okay, so I've just launched that poll, Lindell, for everybody. So please just mm -hmm. um, vote and I can see over 50% of people have already voted. So if you could pick one, have you discussed your driving with your doctor? Yes, in detail. Yes, but just in passing. No, the doctor hasn't raised it. No, I'm worried about the consequences or other. So most people have already voted, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. and, Great. Um, I'll just give a couple more moments for the last few people to cast their vote. And I'll close that poll. And it's anonymous, guys. I can't see who's putting in what answers. So um, all of that remains anonymous on the polls. So I'm just going to close that now. Most people have voted. And I'm just going to share the results there, Lindell. So we've okay. got 54% yeah. yes in detail, 18 yes, but just in passing, 21 no, doctor hasn't raised it, 7% no, I'm worried about the consequences. Yeah, so that's that's great that um, over half have discussed it in detail with the doctor. Because um, what I want to talk to you a little bit about is your legal obligations as a license holder that's got a medical condition. Um, because um, the, the legal ramifications, if you do drive with a medical condition that could affect your ability to drive is huge. So it's really important to be aware of, of your responsibilities. So it's really pleasing to see that over half have discussed it with, with your doctor. Um, okay. So what are our legal and ethical issues? Um, and these actually, you know, they're for every single license holder within Australia um, that we actually have, all, all license holders have a legal obligation to advise the licensing authority of any injury, illness or impairment that may affect your driving. Now, obviously this relies on you having insight into your condition um, and discussing it with your doctor as to whether these symptoms will affect your ability to drive. So when you apply for a driver's license, when you renew your driver's license, there's the really fine print um, that a lot of us don't tend to read before we sign it. Um, but it actually says there that I will um, advise the, the licensing authority, whoever that be, the RMS Vic Roads, um, 
if I have a medical condition. It doesn't automatically mean that you're going to lose your driver's licence. It doesn't mean that you're going to need to go through an extensive OT assessment. It just means you've notified them. Um, they'll ask for a medical report from a doctor and the doctor can say, yes, you have MS, um, but there are no current symptoms or the symptoms are managed um, so that it wouldn't affect your ability to drive, so they can sign you off. So it's really important to have notified the licensing body of your condition. If you don't notify the licensing body and you are unfortunately involved in an accident, um, there are legal ramifications. Um, insurances can be voided um, because you haven't notified the licensing body of your condition. As a health professional, um, and doctors included, um, we have an obligation to ensure that the public is safe. Um, so we can notify the licensing bodies um, on people's behalves. It's something we don't like to do because we'd like to encourage you to do it yourself, um, but it is definitely something that can be done, um, as can family members as well, that can actually be done anonymously. So it's really encouraged um, to have the conversation with your doctor, let the licensing body know um, so that everyone, including yourself, are, are safe. Okay, so You've notified your licensing body. Um, you know, the first step is really that medical report. So the, the licensing body will ask for that medical report from your GP or your specialist. Um, on that report, they will either say, everything's all good, you can continue to drive. Um, they might wanna see you more regularly every six months, depending on um, the type of MS you have. Um, they may say you need to have an assessment completed, a practical on-road driving assessment. There are actually national guidelines um, for driving that all doctors um, are aware of and should have a copy of. Um, and when it comes to MS as a, a neurological condition, um, it comes down to the doctor um, meeting with you, doing an assessment in their rooms of, so they can make a judgment as to whether they think you're safe or whether they think you need to progress to an on-road assessment. So as it says, an OT driving assessment may be recommended by the doctor. Um, the most common recommendation that we get is that multidisciplinary team complete an assessment, um, so off-road assessments and an on-road assessment. So um, the OT assessment is the practical side of it um, and it's always done you know, liaising with the doctor to make sure that, that everyone's on the same page. Does anyone, Linda, does everyone know got, what an OT? Sorry, Linda, I've just got a quick yep. question here from Carolyn. Yes. And yes. Carolyn said that she's just had a session from the OT and she said that I have to go through the GP before getting assessed for hand control car. Is that correct? Yes, so you'll need to get medical clearance from the doctor, which says that you um, should have an OT driving assessment, um, and then you would have the OT assessment done, um, which would look at trialling different types of hand controls, which we're going to go into um, in, in a little bit as well, some different types. But yeah, you do generally need clearance from a doctor. So the doctor's role is to say, you meet standards to be able to hold an assessment, to, to be able to hold a licence, but we don't know if we need to change things in the car, um, so let's send you for an assessment to work it out. So yeah, short, long answer short, um, yes, you need to go through your GP to get a referral for an OT driving assessment. Lovely, thanks Lindell. Okay, um, so do people know what an OT driving assessment is? Um, have people had an assessment done? Um, I'd love to, love to know what, what people's sort of background is on, on knowing what an OT driving assessment is. Um, Fantastic. So I've launched that poll, Lindell, and people are already mm -hmm. answering, yes, I've already had an assessment, or yes, mm -hmm. but I don't want to do one, or no. And yep. well, people are very fast. They're very attentive <laughs> here today. We've got over 90% of people have um, answered the poll. So the reaction time is good. The reaction time is phenomenal, <laughs> I think. <laughs> um, and the concentration, so that's great. Yeah. I'm just going to close and share that information. Mm -hmm. So we can see here that 15% uh, of people have okay. said yes, I've already had an assessment. 
15% have said yes, but I don't want one. And most people here today have not had a driving assessment. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Okay. Most people do not know. Do not know. Okay. Yeah. And they will know by the end of this webinar, which is fabulous. They will. Yes. Some of the fear yes. and mystique will be taken out of uh, the assessment. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it does it does seem like a scary thing, I guess, an assessment um, when you've been driving for, you know, maybe 30 years of your life, maybe even longer to then have to think about having someone come in the car with you and assess your ability to drive can be quite anxiety provoking. So hopefully um, what we go through today will explain to you that um, a, you are going to be anxious if you do need to have an assessment that's to be that's to be expected um, but it is all about trying to facilitate you to be safe and to be able to continue to drive okay so let me explain then what an ot driving assessment is um, it is quite an involved assessment um, and a lot of the times people think i really don't need that i just want to go out for a drive um, but there is part of the assessment which is called an off-road assessment which sounds really glamorous we don't go driving off-road it's actually a clinic-based assessment um, a lot of us ot's will actually come to you and do it in your homes um, but there are other ot's that will have um, rooms for you to go to or a hospital clinic to go to as well so the off-road assessment is completed by a driver trained occupational therapist um, so we have done additional postgraduate training in driving um, and we tend to specialize in this field so the off-road assessment can take about an hour and a half. Um, it's really an information gathering session where we get to learn a little bit more about you um, so we can you know, pinpoint what exact things we want to look for when we go out in the car with you. So we'll do an interview with you, talk to you about the symptoms that you have, talk about your driving history, where you want to drive to, why you want to drive, the type of car you've got, um, the types of supports you've also got around you for driving. Uh, we do a physical screening, which is all done while you sit down. So there's no running around the block or anything like that. Um, it's looking at your movement and your strength that you've got available in your body. So specifically looking at vehicle controls, um, are you going to have the physical capacity to be able to use a standard accelerator and brake pedal, a standard steering wheel? If not, what is the functional capacity, the physical capacity you've got for what types of modifications we've got available. So that gives us a lot of information about what we may need to trial when we go out in the car. So that's quite an important part of it. We do a visual screen of you. Um, and a lot of the times you might've already been to see an eye specialist or an optometrist, which is really great and really helpful. Um, when it comes to, um, medical guidelines for driving, um, the vision ones are fairly clear cut. So if you don't have the visual acuity to be able to drive, so the ability to see and discriminate things, um, even with wearing glasses, you won't be able to drive. Um, and the same as what we call your visual fields. So your peripheral vision when you drive, there are specific standards for that. So pretty much if there's a visual impairment that doesn't meet the Australian guidelines for driving, that will rule you out straight away. So we do want to check your vision to make sure that that's all good before we get in a car. We do a cognitive screen. Um, now the cognitive screen that is done in an OT driving assessment is not a pass or fail test. It's purely an information gathering screen that gives us information about how you think. So your processing of information, um, your um, ability to remember and recall, um, your, your, what we call your working memory. So the ability to do um, you know, a few things at once um, and the speed of how you do that. Um, so really in an OT driving assessment, there should never be, um, in an off-road assessment, there should never be, oh, you didn't pass a cognitive test at all. It's all about how you complete the test. So we get a bit more of an understanding of your abilities. It's also really good at telling us how you learn. Um, so that if we are going to be putting you into a car with different controls, um, we want to be able to help you learn those as, as quickly and as efficiently as possible. So it gives us that information 
as well. You will find in an OT driving assessment, depending on um, your location of where you live, so state, um, there are different types of cognitive tests used. Um, none of them are proven to be um, uh, you know, cut and dried. Yes, you're safe to drive. No, you're not safe to drive. Um, the best thing to do is to go for an actual drive. So as I said, it's an information gathering screening tools that we use. We do a little bit of a test of your road knowledge. Um, it's generally, as you can see on the screen, um, some intersections like this. Once again, this is not pass or fail. It gives us an idea of where you're at with your road rules if we need to review some of these with you. Um, so it's nothing like how far can you park from a, you know, a, a fire hydrant or anything like that or um, from a corner. We don't go through those types of things because you're an experienced, experienced driver. Um, and we also look at how you're feeling about driving and getting back to driving. So your emotional status and what it actually means to you. Um, you know, driving um, can be a real identity for, for people, particularly those who have been commercial drivers. Um, so we need to get a little bit of an understanding about what it means to you, particularly if we need to consider um, reducing how much you drive in the future and planning for stopping driving if that's something that is identified as being needed. Okay, so once the off-road assessment's done, we, we progress to an on-road assessment. Now, depending on your OT, these can be done on the same day um, or they can be done on separate days. So that's worth discussing if you need to have an assessment done and you find fatigue is a big issue um, to split them up because we want you to be able to um, perform to the best of your abilities, but we also want to um, be able to manage any fatigue that happens. Um, it is, I, I actually do tend to do everything on the one day with a little bit of a break in between just to keep the momentum going. So the on-road assessment is completed by the OT and by a driving instructor in the driving instructor's vehicle. Um, so the driving instructor's vehicle has dual controls. It's a, it's a way of controlling the safety of the vehicle, the safety of us in the vehicle and the safety of other people in the driving environment. Um, if there are major issues in the driving instructor's vehicle, we can you know, determine if it's because it's a different vehicle um, and we can look at going in your own vehicle if we deem it safe, but is usually done in the driving instructor's vehicle. The driving instructors have tend to tend to have completed some additional training. So they've done some additional training on medical conditions um, and they've more than likely got different types of modifications in their cars as well. So the driving instructor ensures the safety of the vehicle and the occupants. Um, the OT is in the back seat on the back passenger side, so on the, the left side behind the driving instructor. And our job is to look at are there any effects of the MS on your ability to drive or, or your safety with driving? One of the big things is when you've driven for a long time, you pick up driving habits. We've all got them, good ones and some not so good ones. Um, the OT is able to determine whether it's a driving habit or whether it is part of, the con of your medical condition. Um, so if there are bad habits that make you unsafe, that's something that will get discussed. Um, but it's the OT's job is really to look at your condition. Um, and we consider the fact that, you know, you, you might have been a truck driver for 50 years. So things like checking a reversing, you know, a, a rear view mirror is not something that you're going to do regularly because in a truck you don't have that. So, um, yeah, we're really looking at the impact of your condition on your ability to drive. Um, the on-road assessment, um, probably the biggest one for a lot of people with MS is looking at trialling out different vehicle modifications. Now, different driving instructors can have different types of vehicle modifications available. So, um, you know, when if you get referred for an OT driving assessment and you're discussing it with the OT, it's important to ask them what variety of modifications they have available. Um, if they don't have them available for you to trial, it's something that I suggest you, you do go and have a look at or they can help you to locate someone else that's got that particular type of modification. And I will go through some of the modifications um, a little bit later on to show you what's available. Um, and they do differ sort of in, in the manufacturer as well, but the, the, um, the principle behind them all is, is fairly common. During the assessment, yeah, we always I... provide... Yep. Yes, sorry, can I ask a question at this point? Would that be okay? Hmm. 
Yes. Okay. It's um, from David. Um, yes. It's a little bit, a little bit long, but I think it's probably very pertinent to a lot of people. And so okay. David said, I wanted to preempt advancing disability. And so I contacted a driving OT through a car modification company. They said, yes. if I attended, I would have to be assessed. And then if mods warranted, were warranted, then his license would be revoked immediately. And he says, seeing as I was happy to drive, but was planning for the future to understand what mods are available and how they differ, I was yes. happy with my driving ability. Um, I was not going to risk my license in this manner. And I can appreciate yes. this might be a concern for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So he didn't progress the assessment. And he'd yep. like to understand, and you started to touch on that, Lindell, how one can understand and try vehicles to prepare for the future without jeopardizing his license. Yeah, yes. And that is why a lot of people leave it to the last minute um, when they need the modifications, um, because there is that fear that you'll um, you know, lose your licence um, while you're waiting for them. So, um, and definitely a, a, war a warranted concern. Um, generally, to trial the modifications in a car, it is done via an OT driving assessment. Um, so to be able to, if you're driving competently at the moment, um, but you are planning for the future, what the OT should do with you is get you to drive the car in a standard manner. So with the, with the standard controls. So we can see that at this current time, you are capable of driving without modifications. So we would recommend that you continue to hold your current license. Um, however, you're wanting to trial different modifications. So we will do that with you in the car so that when your condition does progress and you're not able to use the standard controls, you'll know what is available for you. Um, if you want to get them you know, modified, um, get your car modified um, you know, while in, in preparation for that, you can do that while you continue to hold your license, your standard license to drive. Does that hopefully answer the question? Was David it does to... from my point of view. I'll let you know David can, can reply and I'll keep you posted, but that sounds good. Thanks, Lindell. Yeah, because that is a big concern, particularly when you, when you learn, um, when you're needing to learn how to use new controls to drive, um, the general process the licensing body does is downgrades your license to a learner's permit. So if you're working um, and you're currently driving, but you're planning for the future, you need to have that discussion with the OT to demonstrate, I can drive a standard vehicle, but I'm planning for the future, keep me on my full driver's license so I can continue to drive while I do these investigations. Um, so that's definitely Super. something that can be done. Thank you. Yep. And David said, thank you. Yes, that does answer his question. Okay, perfect. Yep. Um, so throughout the on-road assessment, um, yeah, the last little point is that we provide feedback. So um, if there are cognitive issues when you're driving, if there's difficulties with making decisions, making the wrong decisions, we don't let you drive for, you know, usually it's, it's 45 minutes to an hour. We don't let you drive for the 45 minutes and then just let rip at you at the end of the assessment um, and tell you all the things you did wrong. Our job is to address them with you. So we would pull over, we would identify maybe one or two things that we're a little bit concerned about and try and get you to work on those so we can see if we can correct those with you. Um, so an assessment um, can be a scary thing but it can also be quite exciting if you're um, you know, having difficulties physically controlling a vehicle and we've worked out a new way for you to drive that makes it nice and easy for you, um, reduces any fatigue so that you can get back on the road um, and be safe. So um, after the assessment, um, there are generally four different types of ways the recommendations can go. Now, depending on what state you're in, the role of the OT um, can, can differ with regards to the recommendations. So in New South Wales, the, the driver trained OT makes the recommendations on licence status to the RMS. The RMS Look at, the medical, look at the report that we provide and make a decision based on the medical information they have and our report. So the RMS is ultimately making the final decision. 
In Victoria, um, it comes down to the OTs. Um, they make that final decision, um, which is then um, disseminated by, by Vic Roads. So um, there's no extra testing that's done in New South Wales. There is, and it's a little bit confusing, but your driver trained OT should be able to explain that to you. So if you're in New South Wales, if you're going to be driving a car that has modifications on it, you have to do another driving test with the RMS, um, which does sound scary, but the driving instructor trains you up so that you can use your modifications in all different types of driving environments. So passing that test is going to be a breeze. In Victoria, there is no test with Vic Roads. It's the OT that does it with you after you've learned to drive with the modifications. So this process should all be explained to you before you do the assessment. So generally after an assessment is done, the OT will give you the recommendations then and there. Don't let the OT go without giving you those recommendations. Um, and what we all aim for is that everything's all okay for you to be able to drive, continue to hold your current full driver's license, if that's what you hold at the time of the assessment, um, and you continue to resume driving. Um, generally with conditions like MS, um, we will recommend that there are some medical reviews um, that, that are undertaken. So generally once you notify a licensing body that you have a medical condition, they will send you annual reviews, which is just a form to get completed by the doctor. Depending on the type of MS you have, we may bring those reviews up to six months, even less in the on with your doctor. Um, we may recommend that you have some lessons if there's some cognitive issues going on, um, just to upgrade your skills, continue to practice, um, you know, information processing types of things. Um, if there's vehicle modifications that you need, so if you need to progress to hand controls, um, lessons are definitely needed. Um, no matter how good a driver you were before, you're learning how to drive a new way um, and if you still have movement and sensation in your legs, learning hand controls when you've still got your legs that can still do some function can be quite difficult to do. So we want the use of the hand controls, the, using the, the hand operated brake to be what you go to straight away in an emergency situation. So you'll need to have lessons um, to learn these new ways of driving. And unfortunately, on some occasions, um, if there are issues that we can't correct during the on-road assessment, we will recommend that people's licence be cancelled on medical grounds. So that's because of the effects of the MS, not because of you as a person um, or you as a driver in the past. It's the results of, of the condition and what that's doing for you um, and, and impacting upon your driving. It's not something that any of us like to do because we understand that that has you know, roll on effects into your life, but sometimes for your safety and for other people's safety on the roads, that has to be done. So usually after an assessment, it, these are the recommendations, they'll go either of these four ways. Okay, so I thought it might be nice to have a look at um, some different types of modifications that are available. Um, so it gives you a bit of information if you do need to have an OT driving assessment, um, that these types of things are out there for you. So um, this one is, is what's called a left foot accelerator, which is pretty self-explanatory, really. Um, there are a couple of different types of, of left foot accelerators available. So we would get to this type of modification if um, your right leg is not functional for driving. So if you don't have the movement in your right leg to accelerate or to brake, um, you don't have the sensation or the ability to know where your foot is positioned, which can be quite common in MS, that people might have the movement, but the ability to judge how far to move it, to go from pedal to pedal can be impaired. Um, also the speed of the movement as well. So a left, if your left foot and your left leg um, are, are better than the right, the left foot accelerator can be an option. Um, so in this case, the right accelerator, so the standard accelerator on the vehicle, which you can see on the left side of the screen, is actually flipped up out of the way. As you move across to the picture on the right, you can see that it's flipped up and the left foot accelerator is down. So they actually, one flips up, one flips down. Um, so 
with any type of modification that is done to a vehicle, it needs to be able to be driven by an able-bodied driver. So if there are family members that are going to be driving your vehicle, um, you know, they, they, they need to be able to get in and use the standard controls, as is any type of mechanic that's going to need to service your vehicle. So it's, it's all the modifications need to be able to be reverted back to use by standard controls. So there is another type of left foot accelerator system which puts a cover over the top of your standard accelerator, particularly if it's one that's attached to the floor. We can't flip that out of the way. So there's a couple of different options for a left foot accelerator. I must admit in my experience, it's not something that's used a great deal with people who have MS. Um, they tend to progress more to hand controls to eliminate any lower limb use on pedals. Um, so as we move on to hand controls, these have progressed a lot in over the last 10, 15 years. Um, right at the beginning when I first started doing driving assessments, we pretty much had one type um, of hand controls, um, which you can see on the left. Now these are called push-pull hand controls and these are mechanical controls. So it's all done via linking to the accelerator and the brake in the car. Um, so this one is what we call pull-push. So you pull towards you to accelerate and you push to brake. In Victoria, um, there's ones which are called push pat. So you push the lever down. So you can see the lever on the, the right hand side of the steering column there. You push it down to accelerate and then you push the whole lever away to brake. Um, these are the cheapest types of hand controls that are available um, and the most basic. Um, with these types of hand controls, if you're taking one hand off the steering wheel to be able to accelerate and brake with one of them, you have to have a knob on the steering wheel to be able to steer. That's actually an Australian standard that you need to have that on the steering wheel. Um, it helps with, with control of the steering wheel. On the right hand side is an electronic type of hand control. These are called e-radials because um, it's a radial type of downward movement that you use to accelerate. So you can see sort of the, the lever coming out from under the steering column there and it goes up sort of like a end of a W, I guess the best way to describe it. Um, you push that down only really gently because it's all electronic. Um, you push that to accelerate and then you just push the whole lever forward to brake. So in terms of fatigue levels, the electronic controls, so that e-radial system is a lot easier to use um, and is less fatiguing. So people with MS will tend to go more to electronic controls for that reason, because it's not so tiring to have to pull all the time. And once again, there's a, a spinner knob on that steering wheel there. So when an able-bodied driver is to hop in the car, those lever hand controls can stay there. Um, there's a switch with the, with the electronic ones that just get switched off. Flip the accelerator pedal down and they're able to drive it like a standard vehicle. The spinner knob pops on and off the steering wheel. So you can just pop that in the glove box um, while they're driving. So those are probably the most basic types of hand controls. Um, if there are fatigue issues, we would generally move on to the next level of controls that, that I will show you that keep two hands on the steering wheel. So as you can see with those ones, one hand is going to be doing the accelerating and braking and the other hand is going to be doing the steering. So if there's shoulder issues, um, then you might want to progress onto sort of the next level of controls. So these are um, what, what's called accelerator rings. So a lot of people with MS, in my experience, um, progress to these types of controls because it's much more like typical driving. You've got two hands on the steering wheel. Um, so on the left, you can see um, the, the ring, which sort of, I always try to explain it to people that it's like the rim of a, a wheelchair, a manual wheelchair. Um, so that's the, the accelerator itself. It just slides onto a little bracket um, on top of the steering wheel there. Um, so it can come in and out. Um, something really important to keep it safe because it's not a cheap piece of equipment. Um, and you can push down on that ring, as you can see in the middle picture, um, you can push down anywhere on that to accelerate. So you can push at the top, you can push at the bottom. So the beauty of this is that you can take one hand off if you wanna grab a drink of water um, and you can still be accelerating with the other hand. Um, so 
it's quite a nice control for fatigue because you've got both hands equally on the steering wheel and it's a bit more natural, a natural way to drive. You also need to have a brake lever with these types of controls. So they vary depending on the um, vehicle modifier that you're going to use. Um, we're really lucky in New South Wales. We have, um, a, we have quite a few, as do other states, but we've got um, a vehicle modifier that's got this customised control that you can see on the left, which is sort of the um, sort of curves to be next to the steering wheel. So what you can do is hold on to the steering wheel um, and brake by just sort of moving your hand across. So your hand is still staying in contact with the steering wheel. So that's a custom one that's done. This allows you to then use the standard indicators, standard wipers, um, all of those types of things. Um, you can see in the middle picture, there's a different type of braking system, um, which is down a little bit lower, which means you've got to take your hand off to push. So that's also a really common type of thing. So that's your accelerator ring with a brake lever. The one on the right um, is what's called a ghost accelerator. Um, it sits behind, you hopefully can be able to see it sitting behind the steering wheel. Um, it works by rotating it either to the left or to the right. So it's only a little movement like this to accelerate. Um, in my experience, people with MS tend to find the overring, so this bigger one on the front, a little bit more easier to use um, because it is more of a gross movement for pushing rather than the tiny little movements um, if there's sensory changes um, to be able to use the one, the, the ghost accelerator ring. Called a ghost because you can't really see it. Um, that can't get taken on and off, so that's constantly on there, but there's a little switch that you can turn on and off. Same type of system, use the standard indicators, which is really a great thing to be able to have access to. Take one hand off, um, you know, if you if you need to drink water or or change the radio or the, the climate control. Um, okay, so moving along to show you some other types of, of hand controls. The left one here is what's called a satellite accelerator. Um, so it is, just your accelerator itself, where you use your hand with your thumb um, to push the accelerator on. So you do have to have good sensation to be able to use this. There is a wireless version of this, um, but there's also a corded version. Um, so with the wireless one, you have to make sure it's charged up. Um, with the corded one, obviously the cord's going to be there. Um, some people like this, some people don't like it at all. So it's really good if you have access to it to have a go with it. Um, has to be used in conjunction with a brake lever. So it's probably been around um, for about maybe five or, or six years. So it's still a fairly, um, fairly new modification, but used by a lot of people as well. Um, but you do need to have really good um, sensation in your thumb um, and that ability to judge how much movement um, for how much you're accelerating. The one on the right is a floor mounted type of hand control. So um, it, it's becoming a little bit more popular, particularly um, with airbags um, in vehicles, um, but also with leg clearance to be able to transfer in and out of a vehicle. So this is positioned on the left side, very similar to the mechanical controls with that um, pull towards you to accelerate, push to brake. Um, so it's just on the floor um, rather than being underneath the steering column. Okay. If those types of controls aren't suitable for you, um, all is not lost. Um, there are some really high level types of controls that are available. Um, these are called zero effort or low effort controls. Um, often the buzzword um, that they're called is space drive controls. They're a, a German product, um, predominantly done by a company, or only done in Australia by a company in Sydney called Problem Management Engineering. Um, this is a really specialised area of, of driver rehab. So if you can't use any of those previous types of controls, um, you would need to get referred on to a, a, a driving OT that does this field of work. Um, so as you can see, um, this is a what we call a dual system. So um, closest to you is a brake and accelerator system. 
um, which only requires small amounts of movement to be able to operate. And in the distance on the right hand side over there, there is what's called a mini wheel, um, where it's only small amounts of movement that's needed to be able to turn the steering wheel. So um, hopefully this is not something you would need to progress to, um, but there are people that, that have had to, to go to these types of controls. Um, a big new way of learning um, with these because they can be quite sensitive. Yeah. Lindell, a few questions yes. here, as mm -hmm. you can imagine. Um, yes. So Maria has asked, is it true that you have to have a fairly new car to get hand controls put in? Um, if you're asking from a funding perspective, um, somewhere like NDIS, then there are age limits on a vehicle. They are a little bit flexible though. Um, if you're funding the controls yourself, um, it's, it's your decision as to whether you want your 10 year old car to be modified. A lot of the controls can be transferred from one vehicle to another, but obviously there's a cost involved in it. Um, but from a funding point of view with NDIS, yes, there is restrictions on how old the car can be. Okay, and Lee's just commenting that she's had new controls fitted and mm -hmm. they operate like a motorbike and she seems very happy with that result. So yes, yeah. Yeah. Um, so they're probably more of a push pad type of system. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Lucy's saying, um, hi, my license has already been cancelled on medical grounds by a mm -hmm. rehab doctor I saw once. I'm having an OT assessment next month. If mm -hmm. okay, is a new license issued immediately there and then? Okay, so depending on the outcome of the assessment, if you're able to drive a vehicle, a standard vehicle, without any modifications and you demonstrate that you're safe to do that, then the recommendations go to the licensing body um, and they will then issue you with the, your, your full licence to be able to drive. If there's modifications that are needed during the assessment, um, you're issued with a learner's permit while you learn to use those modifications. Um, so it really does depend on the outcome of the assessment. It can take, depending on what state you're in, it can take a little while for the licensing body to process the report. So um, if your license has been suspended currently um, and it needs to change, then it's not gonna happen on the spot because it needs to be actioned by the licensing body. Great, thanks. Thanks, Lindell. And one uh, comment here from Carolyn. I've heard that the car has to be under seven years too. So um, is that correct? Um, no, you can have, so you could get, you can get hand controls fitted into your 10 year old car if you're going to be funding it for yourself. Um, there's no reason you can't do that. Um, you just need to be aware that if you plan on getting a new car in two years time, you're gonna be up for the expense of, of replacing, of, of transferring them across. Um, with NDIS, they do generally tend to say that three year um, with the kilometres on it, but if you can prove that your vehicle um, is roadworthy, has been regularly serviced, the kilometres are low, um, the OT should support you um, in requesting the vehicle modifications to an older vehicle. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Lindell. Okay. So, the it's all great to get you back to driving, but I also wanted to touch on some different types of things that you might need. Because um, a lot of the times you might see an OT and they'll give you controls and, and help you get back to driving using modified controls, but you've got things like wheelchairs that you need to be able to take with you. So I just wanted to touch on a few of these things um, so that you're aware of the options that are available out there. Um, if you're in a powered chair um, or if you use a scooter for longer distances in the community, um, on the left hand side you can see there is a, like a lifter type of crane system that you can put into the back of your car, obviously dependent on the make and model of the car. We have to make sure that it fits, um, but these are options that are available that I would recommend you discuss with your, your OT. So don't let your driving OT um, say goodbye to you. Um, without addressing these things if you're using a mobility device. Um, in the middle you can see that's a, um, a, a manual chair, um, customised, um, and that's lifting it into the vehicle. Um, on the right hand side um, it's a folding manual chair, this is a WIMO 
hoist um, so that the, the driver actually transfers in um, sideways from their manual chair into their vehicle, um, attaches the WIMO straps to, folds up the wheelchair, attaches the straps, it presses a button and it electronically raises and gets onto the roof. There are a couple of different types of these. You can get covers for them. Um, you can get closed in ones. So these are just a general idea of what's available out there so that you can discuss these options with your driving OT. And then if you're in a Linda, power chair, yes, sorry. <laughs> Linda, okay. I just want to ask a question here from David. It's quite a, a specific for David question, but again, I think it might apply to some other people. Um, mm -hmm. And apologies if I'm butting in, it's hard to find a, a good time <laughs> to, uh, to interrupt. So excuse okay. me. So David's asking if he is right leg impaired, so he's got partial mm -hmm. movement, but his left leg is good. Mm -hmm. Can he use both feet in an auto, in automatic situation, i.e. good leg on the brake and part movement on the accelerator? And then okay. he could drive safely. And would his license need to change to automatic from manual only? Yes. So this is something, unfortunately, um, medical standards for driving are national. Um, but there are different rules state to state. So depending on what state David is in, in New South Wales, um, we could look at using your right foot to continue to accelerate and your left foot to brake. Um, we would do a lot of on-road practice with that in the assessment. So a lot of reaction time, making sure you're not resting that right foot on the accelerator, taking it off when you brake. Um, so that is something that definitely can be looked at in New South Wales. In Victoria, um, Vic Roads do not like you to do a left foot braking um, type of situation. So accelerating with your right foot, braking with your left foot, so two footed driving um, is not acceptable in Victoria. Um, so in terms yep. of, yep. Let's hope that David's in New South Wales then. Yeah, it does. Um, I mean, from a safety point of view, I would definitely encourage you, if you have an assessment done, if the left leg, if, if there's no impact upon the left leg, for safety reasons, I if you're gonna be using the left leg to brake, why don't you try out the left foot accelerator? Um, I completely understand though that it will then limit you to cars that only have a left foot accelerator, but from a safety point of view, having something there that you're consistent with and you're reliable with is the most important thing rather than you know having a right leg that may not be great one day but might be all right the next day. So safety reasons I would consider the modifications, but it's definitely something to look at on road. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Linda. Okay. Um, okay. So um, often you might progress to where you're in a powered wheelchair. Um, you can't transfer or you can transfer, but being able to take the powered wheelchair with you when you get to where you want to get to is really difficult. Um, and this is where you can progress to a wheelchair accessible vehicle. Um, there are specific vehicles that can be modified for wheelchair access. Um, so it's important to talk to the driver trained OT about this. Um, and there's different ways of accessing. These are actually both van type conversions. Um, there are smaller ones available as well. Um, so on the left, you can see a, what we call a side entry um, with a, a platform lift. So um, in this case, this gentleman fluctuated between using a uh, manual wheelchair um, but also a powered wheelchair. Couldn't push a manual wheelchair up a ramp. Um, so we got this sort of lifting system in so he could um, either use the manual chair or the power chair to access the vehicle, transferred internally across onto the driver's seat, which is the safest place to drive from. Um, so there's that type of conversion available. Um, and then on the right hand side is a rear entry conversion where this gentleman has gone straight in in his wheelchair. Um, really great if you've got fatigue, don't have to worry about transfers um, and just drive from your wheelchair. This isn't an easy thing to set up um, and it's not something quick to set up, um, particularly if you're going to be getting funding assistance through NDIS. Um, you really need an OT that's experienced in this um, and knows how to, to clinically justify it for you. But I just wanted you to be aware that, um, you know, if you progress to a wheelchair um, and you're concerned that that means you're in a powered chair, you won't be able to drive. That's not the case at all. There are 
when it comes to physical impairments, we can pretty much overcome everything. It's just the more involved you get, the, the more expensive it is. So um, if there's no cognitive issues, um, we can definitely look at helping you continue to drive. Um, so following driving, because I'm aware of my time limit, um, obviously once you cease driving, um, it, it is a process of grieving um, a part of your life that and a part of your independence. So it's not something that um, you expect to just get over overnight when you're told that you can no longer drive. So if you plan for that, um, that will help you um, adjust a lot more quickly if you've got an OT to, to talk through and plan these things. Things like community transport, um, I know not great accessibility sometimes to be able to get them at the times you need them, but that is one of the options available. Um, taxi services, um, if you've got them available in your area with the taxi subsidy scheme, or being able to have a support worker assist you to take you. Um, something we always encourage people to do is maybe write down um, a timetable or a, a weekly diary entry of where they need to go so we can work out what community transport or what support services we can set up for them so they can continue to access the community because despite the fact it feels like your life is over when you can no longer drive for some people um, it doesn't mean you can't continue to access the community it's just rejigging the way that we do things um, so it's definitely something that needs to be discussed um, the OT shouldn't just let you go and say sorry you're no longer able to drive these options need to be discussed with you um, so we can keep you to be to be able to be participating in the community. Um, okay, so I'm hoping um, because I have talked a lot um, that you might now for those people that um, haven't spoken to their doctor or they've just done it in passing. Um, I'm hoping that now having this little bit more information about how OTs can help you, you might feel a little bit more comfortable speaking to your team about driving. Do people feel they've got a little bit more information and they feel a bit more comfortable? Okay, Lindell, I've launched that poll for everybody. And again, mm -hmm. they're still very attentive and uh, oh, responsive. <laughs> so we've got over 78% of people have voted. So that's terrific. Um, I'll just give a little bit more time for people to respond. Yes, I do or no, not yet. Okay. okay. So we'll just, we've got over 90% of people have voted, so that's terrific. Great. So I'm just going to close that poll and mm -hmm. share the information. And Lindell, you've Great. done a terrific job. Well done. That's good. And well and done I to all our this. listeners as well, yeah, because it is, it is a vulnerable area. And yeah, I'm for keeping up with Lindell. So yeah, yeah, because there I is, I mean, there's a lot of, good, yeah, because there is a lot of information um, that, that, that you need to know about um, and it's an area I'm very passionate about so I do tend to talk a lot um, so I'm pleased that you're able to keep up with me. I think the important thing is to make sure you know if the doctor has referred you for an assessment feel comfortable with your OT, um, ask them the questions, um, speak to vehicle modifiers because they have a role as well um, because ultimately we want you to be safe, we want to be safe out there as well, um, want you know, your family members to be safe so it's it's, it's yeah it's it's important to feel comfortable going in to an assessment and, and yeah, Linda, lots of people you. including Amanda have um, sent their thank yous to you so um, you're welcome Carolyn said so good thank you for your expertise and uh, Tomika said safety definitely number one for all so thank you for your time and guidance so lots of people typing in and saying there thank you and, and from me as well another one coming from Lucy thank you so um, it's nice to know everybody's out there and and listening one last question which yeah. I think is particularly useful actually is from mm -hmm. Iona and says does one have to inform their insurer that they have MS? Um, no, um, you don't need to inform your car insurer that you have MS. If your, your doctor is, if you're not modifying the vehicle and you're driving a standard vehicle, no, you do not. If you're modifying the vehicle with controls, you want to let your insurance company know so that those modifications are included on your insurance policy should anything happen to the vehicle. Um, so if it's modified, yes. Um, if the doctor's cleared you to drive or you've had an OT assessment and you're safe to drive without modifications, then no, you don't need to inform your insurance company. 
Wonderful. And, and I think the ultimate endorsement has just come in from Lee and she said, I've had an OT assessment, I've been transferred to hand controls and I still found today very informative. Oh, good. I'm pleased. So that's lovely to know. Thanks, Great, Lindell. Thank you. No so worries. for our listeners, and you can um, close your webcam now, Lindell. Thank you. And I'm going to um, take the screen back to, to my slides here in Melbourne. And I just want to share with our listeners um, just finally um, some last housekeeping um, for you, which I hope you'll find useful. So just a reminder that the gateway to all of our services is via MS Connect on 1800 042 138. There's a number of reasons my, why you might want to reach out to MS Connect, uh, up-to-date evidence-based information, expert advice on how to manage symptoms, about minimizing the impact of MS, support for people who are newly diagnosed, treatment option information, access to all our education programs, which you can also get up-to-date information on our website about education, connections through peer support, referrals to services in your area, support for you and your family, respite options, to name just a few. So regarding peer support, we do have one-on-one -on -one phone support. We have a number of face-to-face -face groups in different areas for the four states that we look after. And hopefully there's one near you. We have telegroups. We're currently running 12 uh, telegroups. And we have Facebook groups for different people, people living with MS, for carers and for young um, carers. We have a tool online called Get Your Act Together, which is a tool designed to help you better manage your MS symptoms. It is designed for people living in, in the ACT, but it's got useful information for all people. It can be customised and it looks at some of the common symptoms of MS around um, emotions, fatigue, continence, cognition, pain and heat sensitivity, etc. So I do encourage you to get online and have a look at that. It's very useful. We have a wonderful MS employment support service. So if you're in work, we can help support you stay in work and if you're not in work we can help you find new employment and again access is through uh, the MS Connect number and there's a video here you can click on this link or um, you can type this URL into your search engine and have a look at um, the ESS video that explains really well what we do in this area. We are a registered NDIS provider providing different services in different states and you've got this on your handout so you can see what services we provide and please do um, make contact with us so we can assist you um, in the in these areas and we also I'd just like to note provide a lot of support and information around NDIS so we have a number of webinars that you can watch as well to help you get the best plan possible for you just pointing out my age care is available to people who are over 65. You can get information, assistance to map out your needs, assessments for further supports. And the 1800 200 422 is a free call number for you to call to access through my age care. And again, just finally, there's the MS Connect contact details again. And just invite you to stay online after this webinar just to complete a very brief survey which helps us to deliver the best services that we can for you. So thanks again for your time today, really appreciate it and thanks again to you Lindell and um, look forward to seeing you all on our next webinar. Bye for now.